about mind control or psychological manipulation. So the definition of that, according to Psychologically Today, is psychological manipulation can be defined as the exercise of undue influence through mental distortion and emotional exploitation, with the intention to seize power, control, benefits, and or privileges at the victim's expense. So basically, this is harming the victim at every single um, cost, and it's also helping the uh, person who is trying to manipulate the victim's mind. Anyone have questions? No? Okay. Two. Uh, two is just kind of what mind control was. I'll say that. Mind control is the concept of which a subject's thoughts and actions are controlled by an external force, meaning that they don't have complete control of their own body. And um, torture, for example, can set the body into a state of mind control where you really don't want to do what your body is doing, but it's kind of a um, almost like a primal sense, um, like an instinct, and even sleep deprivation or humiliation can cause a control of the same effects. Government propaganda is already a wave of mind control, and it's already influencing us to do things without us even realizing. For example, when you look at things like predictive programming, which is movies, shows, and books that are kind of normalizing mind control or other things that we probably fear right now, but when if the government were to implement them, then we wouldn't think of it as much of a big deal because we've already, already seen it represented in all these shows, movies, and books before. Um, and on, well, oh, according to Patterns of Meeting, which I'm really not sure what their website is, but it says Facebook has been researching the extent of its uh, power over behavior, manipulating its own user, users as guinea pigs. On election day in 2010, it said, go out and vote, reminders to more than 60 million users, causing an estimated 340,000 more to vote, otherwise who wouldn't have. Which, that doesn't, probably seems like not a big deal, probably seems more helpful to us, but if they're able to control us by that one thing, what else could they make us do? Nice job. Any questions? I have three. <laughs> I have two and three. Um, so one of my question was, what strategies does North Korea use to brainwash its citizens? So I'm just going to share one of the strategies I found. So I found that it uses punishment to instill beliefs in its citizens about racial purity and other corrupt principles. So in the article, it gave an example. Um, I'll just summarize the quote. It said, um, they have this thing called racial purity. They don't. They just want Koreans, and um, so that most of the women um, endured forced abortion if their um, babies had Chinese fathers. And so um, what I thought about this was that by putting in place the punishment and pain in relation with a certain topic, the government is kind of brainwashing their citizens to believe that it isn't okay to mix with other races. And then there were also some other strategies I found. And when, good job, so nice work. When, when was this taking place? Um, I'm not sure when, I, it was recent, I, in the, probably like, it was in the 2010s, I can't remember exactly when the article was written. It's key that it's recent, so that's good. Yeah. Thank you. So, one example of modern day mind control is the school institutions that were ran by ISIS when they had control of Syria. So at one point in time, the ISIS terrorist group took over the, took over Syria and they started to enroll all Syrian kids into the schools that they took over and, and, and put their own curriculum into. 
And in this curriculum, the young students were mind controlled to become spies for ISIS and spy on their families and to believe that the terrorist organization was correct in all of their ways. And they did this by making, by like teaching them with weapons and just images and depictions of weapons, bombs, tanks, and guns. And it is a horrible practice that actually tore apart many Syrian, Syrian families. But recently, after Syria had gotten control back, it was put to a stop, and all the children that were affected were put under extensive treatment for the experiences that they were put through, so hopefully the mind control can be reversed. Mm -hmm. okay. Any questions? Okay. So we're going to tie that back when you get over to our George Orwell group. We're going to tie that back to his purpose and make a connection there. So nice job. Okay, next group. Um, so I'm going to start off with the definitions of propaganda. Um, one of the definitions was um, the spreading of ideas, information, or rumor for the purpose of helping or injuring an institution, a cause, or a person. And the next is ideas, facts, or alleged allegations spread deliberately to further one's cause or to damage an opposing cause. Okay, so the question I researched was how much the Nazi seats in the German parliament changed from 1928 to 1932. So at the beginning, I found that they didn't always rule the country of Germany. In the beginning, they had barely any power at all. In 1928, they had just 12 seats in German parliament out of 600. And by 1930, they had over 100. And by 1932, it had almost doubled this. So I began to wonder like, what caused them to gain all this power in such a short period of time, which four years, it might seem like a lot, but it's really a long time, or a really short time, dealing with gaining power over a whole country. So I began to, found, I began to find that they used the power of propaganda to gain all this different support from these different groups. So. What they did is that they didn't really have a limit to what they would do, so they would spend large amounts of money on newspapers, leaflets, poster campaigns with these simple slogans that attracted the public. And also, someone named Joseph Jobels, he was a huge part, and he started to display the image of Hitler, and he portrayed him as someone who could fix their country and make it more stable, and he used people's fear of the unstable instability of the country. And also Hitler himself helped do this because he had like a gift for rallying the public and he was so patriotic and he really just portrayed the idea that he could fix the country. So some of his ideas were to not pay back the countries that they owed money to and he wanted to rearm the country of Germany so that was a huge popularity vote. And most of the public, they saw this as a way that they could fix their country. They didn't really see how inhumane it was as we do today. Mm -hmm. They were really just blinded by the fact that they thought like, oh, once this is over, we're going to be fixed. So it really makes you think how that could happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question was um, researching about the Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, which related to Julia's topic. Um, so, in 1933, uh, Hitler established the Reich Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. The purpose of this was to influence the public, and um, the entire ministry was led by, well, the, the key position was led by Joseph Jobels, and um, he, would, he had a gift in uh, speech king and influ influencing people. So, he was also Hitler's trusted friend and colleague, according to his book. Um, and so during this, using the ministry, they were able to control access to like information outlets such as the radio, the newspaper, um, films, and educational materials. So in that, they began to communicate the Nazi message in a fair and just way. Um, some of the times they portrayed Hitler as like the savior and a good person. Other times they just directed their anger at Jews. And for example, in Nazi films, they portrayed Jews as subhuman creatures infiltrating the Aryan society, so they made it seem like the Jews were the ones to blame, and 
contaminating the society. And so the, um, the gen this, this Ministry of Public Enlightenment propaganda basically was a clever move of Hitler to, um, to do that, to attack the Jews and make it seem, make the Nazi message seem right and just. And remember we saw the, um, those are the top 10 countries that are, you know, kind of controlling, censoring, and um, limiting the rights of their people. And so we can see contemporary examples too. That was very thorough. Good. Um, do we have any from that? Uh, yep, so my question was, why did Hitler believe so strongly in the spoken word over the written word? And uh, Hitler believed very strongly in the spoken word because he thought that the spoken word accounted for most of the big events in history. Mm -hmm. um, according to uh, Reason TV, which is a YouTube video, um, it allows you to direct you direct contact with your audience mm -hmm. and what this means is that um, you can interact with your audience much more than the written word. Mm -hmm. You can uh, uh, make them perceive um, one thing rather than another mm -hmm. and as a speaker or an orator you can reach out to their hopes and fears by um, with your uh, words you can change the way they perceive something with your tone of voice or other um, literary devices. Um, all, another thing is that, um, uh, y like with writing, uh, an ex uh, an ex uh, an exclamation <laughs> point uh, can be uh, portrayed as anger, excitement, or sadness. Whereas in speaking, uh, with your tone of voice, you can uh, make the audience uh, react or interpret that in one way and uh, in a sense the orator can brainwash the audience into thinking something that isn't really right and this is how Hitler um, became one of the most powerful orators and leaders in the world and in history. Mm -hmm. um, my question was, well it was just a task to find, um, to find parallels between the propaganda of Nazi Germany and uh, today's world. So I looked at Nazi Germany and North Korea, and when you look at Nazi Germany, the propaganda there, they were somewhat limited compared to today in the um, technology, but they still, Hitler still got the word out. They put up just physical posters everywhere, all around Nazi Germany, and they tried to have a constant flow going through, going to people um, of we're gonna we're gonna fix the country. We're gonna make it better. It, it's terrible now. They directed, as Selena said, a lot of anger towards the Jews, and then said, "This is the problem, and we're we're gonna fix it." And they really didn't. They kind of shut the people in. Um, and I mean, it was a lot harder for other countries to get messages into the people in Nazi Germany because they didn't have the technology that we have today. But now when you look at North Korea, they really have a constant flow of propaganda going to the people. Um, it just, it never ends there. They, um, they found a way to completely shut in their people. The people in North Korea don't know what's happening in the outside world, and they really don't know what's happening in their own country, because the way that Kim Jong-un has portrayed himself and the government is pretty much the complete opposite of what it actually is. And he is most definitely a dictator. Um, he's got unchecked power, and they put uh, any propaganda that they can onto the TVs, onto everything, radio. They'll, uh, they don't have a free press, free media, or anything. Um, but what I looked at was the poster, that were the Russian poster that was on the paper that we got that said, it was from 1920, so it was the Soviet Union then, but um, it was literacy is the path to communism, and that was pretty bold of the Soviet Union to put that out there, um, but what they were basically saying was to their people um, that literacy, I mean, literacy, they were, you know, if they learned how to read, um, they would evolve and they would know more things um, and they just, they wanted complete control, just like the Soviet, uh, North Korea today. Nice job. So if we had to put North Korea, like, in, if we had to say it was a genre of literature, 
what kind of genre is mostly Aberdeen and from our lens, maybe? From our lens, uh, probably horror. <laughs> or, or dystopian, right? So the, the, the government line there, from what we know, is that it is indeed as it should be, but we know, like from what we read, it's actually upside down, so it's kind of interesting. Okay, we're ready for our next group. Really nice job, guys. We're going to keep talking about this. Today, you're going quickly as you're presenting this, but these things are going to keep coming up as we explore the novel. Okay, so for our presentation, we chose infringements on child's privacy. And so the question I had was, what are some of the ways in which the Patriot Act contradicts the Constitution, and which amendments does the, um, this report say that the Patriot Act violates? So the Patriot Act, some background information about it, is it's basically a law that allows the government to spy on you legally. Or spy, yeah, spy on you. So this does contradict a couple of things stated in the Constitution. So according to House of Works, the right to privacy, not specifically mentioned in the Constitution, but supported by other numerous Supreme Court decisions, and the freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures are most notable infringements. So the Patriot Act goes against both of these, and so um, the first one, the right to privacy, the right to have your own information without the government knowing, and the Fourth Amendment, the right to unreasonable searches and seizures, which basically means that the um, law enforcement cannot come and investigate you or spy on you without having um, information that, um, without knowing that you may be a threat to them and mm -hmm. without a warrant or anything. Okay, so to follow Mark, uh, my questions were what do supporters think of this act and why are critics so outraged about it? And so basically, supporters of the act are stating that um, it's an instrumental, it's instrumental in a number of many acts and in investigations and arrests towards terrorists and stuff like that. So they feel that this is helping to protect and basically um, even prevent harmful situations from happening to our country as a whole. But that, um, so basically it's protection to them, but then first, uh, critics, um, it's, they think basically the complete opposite because they believe that this is, it's really tearing our country apart and our, it's basically, they think it's unconstitutional and um, an article I read states that um, they think the act gives the government too much power, threatens civil liberties, and undermines the um, very democracy it seeks to protect. So they are um, outraged because they think this is an invasion of privacy as well as unconstitutional, although um, it's basically, it, it's both. Like, it's invading privacy, but it's also protecting us. So I feel like it definitely so has what is, like, overall, what does the Patriot Act let the government do? Kind of spy on us, but it also is used to protect us. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly used through, like, the internet. Right. And so when we did the anticipation guide, remember we talked about how we felt about that? When is it okay for the government to, to look into information about us? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good job. I also forgot that yeah. the critics also are outraged about it is because the Congress did not spend a lot of time really understanding the true meaning of it and what could happen, like the consequences of making this act, like implementing it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just to um, back up, I believe what I read was that it was a 48-hour period between when congressmen read it and it was passed. Wow. So a lot of people believe That's that quick. there was not enough time to look over the entirety of the long mm -hmm. and intricate document. So my question was, does uh, wiring someone's home violate their privacy? And what could go wrong with this? So this has been coming up a lot more recently because the... People were happen to wiring el the elders home to make sure, like, so if they have like a heart attack or something, so they can quickly get help for that. Oh, but um, sorry, the, yeah, sorry, this the does so violate the I'll privacy, but I think the, the benefits of getting help quickly when they need it is better than not than better than people like seeing what they do. And the article I read, um. It talked about the the people. And they were like they didn't really care about it because they just, they thought their safety was more important. 
as well as um, or the thing. Something that could go wrong with this is um, because there's one person like watching the people while the home is wired. Um, that person could abuse the information to do not good things. So, but it doesn't invade the privacy, but the safety is worth the, ex the exchange. They were using that at schools, so to track attendance. So it came up; it had come up as an issue, um, and I don't know that it's it was it's being continued, but it was interesting. 